I'm going to talk about software audits, um, which traditionally is a fairly dull topic. It's software and audits. <laughs> it's, it's just as dull as it gets, and the clause is always really long, and you just glaze over, and nobody really cares. But I think what I want to do is quickly talk about what they are and why everybody hates them. I think users of software licenses, re licenses really, 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 really hate them. But I think a lot of software salespeople hate them too, to be completely fair, um, because they poison the relationship with their customers. So they're, they're a very unpopular clause, but they're also... That, that they matter, and I think they become a bit of a hot topic for a number of reasons. Partly, generally, the economic and technical changes, and also there's been some interesting cases, and I'm going to talk about one of them um, as part of my little run through. I'm actually going to talk about a case, which I try not to do, but I am going to do that. And then I'm going to talk, look at some tactics, some practical tips. And, and what I want to be clear is, I think because it's more fun, I'll probably say things that are mean about um, people who license software rather than users, but I don't mean to be. We act for the British Software Alliance. We, we are very, very pro IP owners in this firm. So whatever I say should be taken in that, with that sort of underlying basis. But, but sometimes you get a call at 8 o'clock at night from someone who's just about to be audited and you do feel their pain. So there will be a bit of pain will come through, but, but from a good pro-IP place, I hasten to add. So so then, at the end, I will talk about, though, okay, if you have breached, what do you do? And then that will be quite licensee focused But if you're a licensor, it's good to know what the other half's up to, so you've got some good tactics. So, software audit, what is it? It's a standard right to allow software owners to audit what's being done with their software. And in fact, if you own something and you let someone else use it, but you don't give it away or you don't sell it, in a sense, that's fair enough. You, you ought to have a right to check what's being done with your stuff. Unless you've given it on a complete carte blanche basis, typically, software is licensed and priced based on how it is used, whether it's the number of individual users, the number of machines it runs on, the number of countries it's in, the number of servers it's in. There's all sorts of ways of, of measuring it. And so it is completely fair enough that software owners should have a right to come in and check that those license restrictions are being used. But just there in three examples, it already started getting quite complicated. And I think one of the big issues is just how complicated license restrictions are, which makes the audit so, so complex and um, annoying. And in fact, they, are, they are, can be very, very disruptive. A client of mine, a client of ours, is, has just undergone an audit from a big software house and its costs, both paying me and its professional, other professional advisors and its own internal costs, were $2 million that it could have spent buying software. But it didn't. It spent it managing, defending an audit. And the end of that audit, they found one or two tiny, tiny technical infringements out of the whole estate because this company is very well run. But it just goes to show sort of just why people hate them so much. And then I think one of the reasons people hate them so much is that license restrictions are so complicated and get quite outdated. And so you can see why people like the campaign for clear licensing campaign for clear licensing because unclear licensing causes problems. And one of the reasons licenses are unclear is they tend to be drafted by Americans and so they're not very well drafted. <laughs> and, and also they, they often were drafted a long time ago. You got a license from the 2000s. Nobody, the cloud had not, there was not even a gleam in someone's eye. Maybe in Tim Berners-Lee's eye. But yeah, it wasn't, it didn't exist. And now everything's in the cloud. And if you think about restrictions, I talked about restrictions on users, but it's also on number of machines. When a lot of these licenses were written, you had a desktop. And then everyone got a laptop and a tablet and a phone. So is that four uses or one use? Depends what's in the license. And it can be quite opaque, the drafting. And that causes some of these problems in terms of you do the audit and then the argument starts as to whether or not you're in breach. So that's another reason why, why these things are issues. So I think the final thing is what's in a license agreement is often very different to what people think they've bought. Because what people think they buy tends to be in nice bullet points and slides and PowerPoints. And what they've actually bought is something that's written in a big long clause with lots of capital letters that nobody ever reads. And and that causes a problem, that, that difference or that perceived difference between what people think they're buying and what they've actually signed up to is one of the most crucial issues, one of the biggest drivers of disputes. 
So what do CIOs think? CIOs hate them. And you hear all sorts of horrible things said, like extortion racket and what, what have you. I would never say that, but that's what you hear. And again, going back to we're on the side of the angels here, some people do breach, knowingly breach their licenses, knowingly rip off the license, the, the IP owners, and it is fair enough that that can be checked up on. That's, that's the background. So why are they a hot topic? One of the big reasons is it's the economy, right? Licensors are looking for revenue. They're desperately looking for revenue. The move to cloud has totally undermined some really long-standing traditional license models and huge downsizing in big areas like financial services has meant the number of licenses that they're getting paid for has declined. So you used to have an estate with, say, 100,000 users at a big bank that's now 50,000 users. That's a huge revenue cut. So they're looking for revenue. Also, their traditional customers who they've got 20-year relationships with are going, actually, thanks, guys. There's this startup in Shoreditch that I'm going to be using now, so I don't need you anymore. Bye. And they're losing these customers, so that they are looking for revenue. And again, go back to before the big big bust in 2007, you know, license audit came along, send you a bill for a few hundred grand, you'd pay it. Now, IT teams don't have any money. They, they have to cut what they spend every year, not increase what they spend every year, knowing that, you know, 10, 15% of that might go on audits that have gone wrong. So that, you know, there's people who are looking for revenue and people who are looking for cost cuts. There's going to be, there's going to be more, more challenges and more issues than there were. But it's also technology. I talked about cloud, but also things like virtualization and remote working mean that there's, a, there's this very big mismatch between what old licenses say and what new uses of software are, and that can, can cause these problems. And if you are in the team at a software vendor that is looking for revenue, there's a revenue opportunity. If you can figure out, everyone in the world uses software like this, and our terms say that's against the rules. Let's go audit. Happy hunting. Right? And that's, there's a perception that that goes on, as I say. So, so it's the technology. And then another aspect of the technology is it's easier to find out what people are up to. Big data, everyone says big data. You can't actually give a seminar in this department without saying big data. <laughs> the big data, the processing tools are much cleverer than they were. And they allow, and I have a client here who's, who sells software asset management s solutions for both users of software and, and license, license source. And it, Lice, lice source. And it, those, those tools make it much easier to spot where things have gone wrong just by pressing a button and running a, I guess, a, a little robot through a system to find out what's gone on. You can't give seminars without mentioning robots either. So, and then the wider impacts, wider changes, just impacting software use. m and a big one. A lot of licenses say, if you're a small company, you can have a license on basis A. But if you're a big company, you have to pay 10A unless you buy this little measurement tool to keep you honest. If you're in the little company and you get acquired, nobody goes back and looks at the license to see if they're suddenly on breach because they're now part of a big group. And then the audit comes along and goes, oh, for the last five years, you've been part of Megacorp. You owe us 10 times that license fee for five years. That'll be five million pounds, please, for a company whose IT budget is maybe a million pounds anyway. These, these things happen. I've seen it. So m and and then outsourcing, cloud hosting, all the rest of that is making a difference. So the other thing it's a hot topic, we've seen some interesting claims making it to court. Now, this case caught everyone's eye. Uh, well, not everyone, but people who are IT lawyers. It's uh, AFD software and zip addresses. And there's an actual abstract on it at the back of your pack. But in summary, AFD was a database supplier, and zip needed postal addresses on a database. Um, AFD and zip back in 2005 or 6, discussed the basis of pricing. And they agreed that Zip would stop using its current supplier and start using AFD, and it would get the same stuff to use in the same way for the same pricing. Right? They clicked the license. Of course they didn't read it, because nobody ever reads licenses. Who ever reads stuff when they buy stuff online? And everyone in here is a lawyer. Jeremy does, yeah. OK. Trust the barrister. But no, you know, nobody does. When you buy an airline ticket, you buy software. People don't read stuff. So anyway, so far so good. They carry on using it. 2010, AFD do an audit. And they are shocked to discover that Zip have been using this software 
in a way that means they need to pay them more money. Not just a little bit more money, £12 million pounds plus VAT, which is a sum 1,000 times higher than the sum they were paying up to that point. And this is why I think this case is interesting, because it clearly turns on the fact that the difference was so huge. But on the face of it, Zip was bound to pay the price. The contract said you have to pay it on this basis. The contract had an entire agreement clause. It don't matter what was said before, you have to pay it on this basis. As happens so often, the English judge looked at the contract, said, don't care what's in the contract, I'm going to decide to do what I think is fair, and came up with an estoppel argument which said, because the AFD salesman promised you that you'd get what you had before on the same financial basis you had it before, the fact that you clicked a contract that said the direct opposite is irrelevant, what went on before is the deal you did, and that's what you have to honour. Which is, the, I guess, the right answer in terms of what's fair and equitable, but at complete odds with what contracts are for. So that's quite interesting, but and it makes you think. Going back to what I was saying, most software is sold based on PowerPoints and conversations between salespeople and technology people. Nobody reads the contracts. So this estoppel argument, I had a client who was thinking of running it, and um, they got a barrister's opinion who agreed with me that it's a nice argument to use in the negotiation room, but don't ever go to court with it, because... This case really does, I think, depend on its facts, and it wasn't appealed. It's a first instance decision. But it, it's, it's up the ante in all these discussions. Remember, these discussions are happening more than they used to and are more charged than they used to be because there's this, this tension about the money and the technology. And then this case happened. It, it, it makes it a hotter topic, at least. Not quite as boring as software and audit. <laughs> so so the, case, the case turns on its facts, but it's informed the negotiation that we've seen. So that's, that's the sort of background to where we are. So what do you do? I'm going to look at software audit tactics, three stages in the life cycle of a deal. Before you sign, or more likely click, when you're running through the term, and then what happens when it's invoked. Then I'll look about some negotiation tactics to use around the actual audit clause, and then look at what happens if, if you, have, you have breached. So what do you do? You read the contract. Of course, following AFD and ZIP, there's an argument saying, no, don't read the contract. If you haven't read the contract, you can rely on the pre-contractual representations from the salesman. Obviously, that's a one-off case. Read the contract always. But think about requesting a plain English summary of the restrictions, not a recollection of a conversation, which is what happened in AFD, but an actual plain English, an email, or something, and of course it will say at the bottom, this isn't contractually binding, go and see the contract. And that's what the license source should make sure it says. But look for those plain English summaries and get your technical people to get their heads around it. As Ads was saying, all of this comes down to, the, to understanding what's going on at a technical level. And then thinking about that technical level, think about what's happening now and what might happen. We are going to move to a virtual infrastructure. We are going to roll out tablets to everyone. Does it work in that context? And then going to the actual audit clause, try and negotiate it. A lot of these big vendors you can't negotiate, but try and try, if you can, and address the cost and disruption of the audit clause. For the license saw, as I said, don't rely on your entire agreement clause. Right? That's plain. Even if you don't get to court on it, the negotiation will be informed by what's happened in AFD and ZIP. If, you, if your salespeople are out there saying things that are at diametric odds with what's in your terms, you are going to have to watch out. So be careful. Draft those restrictions as clearly and simply as you can. Think about these plain English summaries. And also, equally, think about how technology change might impact your licensing model. You know the change. These big software vendors, they know what's coming. Think about what's coming and how it might impact your pricing model. Try and preempt it. Because if you can preempt it, there's no gotchas, there's no surprises, the relationship stays warm and fuzzy. Um, and to that point, try if in this audit clause, try and make sure your rights to audit are clear. And as we'll see, sometimes they aren't clear, even though they look really clear. And also, what your rights are if, on invoking audit, you find a breach. Because that's just the beginning of the conversation most often. So during the term, what you find increasingly is that people from big vendors go, we've reduced our terms to three pages. And the whole room erupts in applause. 
and it's three pages of URLs linking to 250 pages of PDF. They haven't reduced their terms at all. They've hidden them away and made it easier to change them. It used to be software would renew annually, and every time it renewed, there'd be little tweaks and changes, reflecting changes to technology or commercial changes. So that the restrictions would evolve over a three, five-year period. Little tricksy words would go in. People hardly ever read this the first time they sign. On renewal, I mean, many people have been house lawyers here. Most of our team have been in, worked in-house. This stuff does not get to lawyers, right? You know, so you know, technology clients need to be aware of it. Sensible ones are, but they don't have the time. And if it's all in this, buried in these PDF documents that just are there at the bottom of an email saying, click here for renewal, nobody's going to read it. So try and find ways to manage that process of renewal and the way terms change. And try and... And, and the big cloud vendors are quite good. We won't, our renewal terms may change, but they won't materially diminish your rights. You know, it, those things, are, if you can agree something like that up front so that when you renew, there's less risk of a gotcha, that's great. But typically, it's very hard to negotiate these terms. You need to watch out for what's going on in them so you stay compliant throughout the term. Um, and seek plain English summaries of the changes. Well, sensible license source will, will issue a plain English term. This is the new terms. Click here, blah, blah, blah. By the way, we've changed this. Like your bank does when it changes its terms. But who reads those? But, you know, it's that sort of thing. But I think for license source, um, they need to, to think about how they communicate changes. And also, IBM's very good at this. They have a whole bunch of FAQs so you can go back and see what's changed. In 2006, we changed it to this. In 2013, we changed it to this. In 2015, we changed it to this. It makes it much harder to run those kind of estoppel arguments that, that call AFD out. And also make legacy terms available. Sometimes when an audit's invoked in 2015, looking at last five years' use, the poor old licensee doesn't know what it signed up to. It might have a bit of stuff stored away on a contracts database from 2010, but those little changes that went along, it's very difficult for it to find out what it, what it was signed up to during that term. Make it available, make it easy for your customer to see where it is. And then another thing for licensees is, is if your business is changing, if you are doing some M&A, or you are changing your business model, sometimes that's a, that's a chance to preempt this. If you know that the number of users is going to go from 50 to 100, you really should pay an extra 50 licenses. Pretty straightforward. But if you're changing a tech, the way you're doing business, going back and looking at that and preempting that with your vendor, thus avoiding all the, hor the horror of a full audit invocation, and perhaps giving you an opportunity to say, well, actually, on the face of it, our license is changed and it's going to cost us 100. Call it 50. We'll pay you by the end of the quarter. Lovely all agreed up front, rather than getting caught out and they come to you for 100 plus interest in two years' time. Does that make sense as a way of, of trying to invoke it? And it, it puts you on the front foot. So, to audit invocation. As I say, I had a call today from a client who's not happy at all. He's got a big red software vendor camped on his lawn. And... It's the most contentious moment, typically, in a license or licensee relationship. Often, licensors sell lots of other things apart from software. So it can really poison consultancy relationships, hosting relationships, cloud relationships, just because one bit of license audit's going on. So I think people all across the board need to be very careful about audit implication. It can be very sensitive when parties are competitors. And I'll, I'll sort of run through a little little case in a second where two competitors this arose. But even, even where there isn't a competitive relationship, it can be very toxic. And when you negotiate these things, it's often the last clause you look at. And when they get invoked, people often don't look at the clause. They go, yeah, all right, come in, do an audit. So a couple of things to think about if audit rights are invoked. If you're a licensee, have a look at the clause. See what rights they actually have. Poor drafting, unclear drafting might mean you say, no, 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 you can't audit. It says you can audit, but you can only audit on a wet Wednesday afternoon in Margate. And I'm not in Margate anymore. You know, it, it, you could, there might be all sorts of things in the clause that stop 
or restrict the ability of the audit to happen to give you that time to make a proposal and avoid all those costs. Consider if you've got a nice, excellent software asset management system, you just press a button and say, you don't need to do an audit. Yeah, I got your letter, but here's this, here's this system. It's by one of the market leading vendors. You don't need to come in. Save your time, save your money. You're right, we're in breach there, but all this other stuff is good. Goodbye. Because these guys want to do, they don't want to run these audits on the whole. If they can, if you, if you preempt it, there's no point in them going through all that pain if you, if you preempt and say, look, let's close off the discussion now. And then ultimately though, and most big clients do do this, is they appoint experts to help. Not lawyers, the people who have, make a profession of being anti-audit. And some of them are management consultants and some of them are IT consultants. And there's a whole, just like you've got the whole firmament of black duck and red hat in the open source space, you've got a whole firmament of advisors in this space. And they know where people settle. And they know where people classically make mistakes in their licensing model. They know where some complex drafting has caught lots of their other customers out. So they can be there at the beginning of the process, again, preempting the issue. Um, meanwhile, the license or I think, again, read the contract. Look what rights you actually have. I think people go in going, yeah, we're going to audit you. And then suddenly someone pushes back and they're not ready for that. Make sure you know what you're going to be doing. So 118 and IDS, it's a slightly interesting case, where, but it's, the, it's another recent-ish case on, on audit. They were competitors in, in um, number informa telephone number information. And 118 sought specific performance to exercise its audit rights. And the clause on the screen, it seems to me it's fairly clear. Any duly authorised representative <coughs> can enter any of the premises where the database is used, for the purposes of ascertaining that the provisions of this agreement are being complied with. Now, one of the provisions was how many installations of the, 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 the database they were allowed to use, but the other provision was that they had to include in their subcontracts similar obligations. So 118 wanted to come in and check all the subcontracts. So on the face of it, it looks like they're entitled to do, but the judge said, no, 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 it's not clear enough for a specific performance injunction. You know, forget it you can go to full trial. So I, I can see where the judge was coming. It's not completely clear. What, what they, the, the judge said, it's not clear whether that's the provisions of this agreement pertaining to the storage and use of the software or all the provisions and use of the agreement. It says ascertaining that provisions of this agreement are being complied with, but the judge said, no, 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 it's not clear whether that means all of the provisions or just the ones pertaining to the software, the database that's being audited. Quite an interesting one. And litigators know better than me whether what the, the standard of proof for a, spe um, a specific performance injunction is maybe sort of higher than for a full case, and that might be why he pushed it back. But again, if you were 118, you'd be reading that, go, I can go in and read all those subcontracts. Absolutely not. So again, be careful in your drafting. So it's a sort of checklist. And this applies whether you're negotiating at the beginning or you're negotiating its invocation. As I said, it's probably more likely that you'll be negotiating its invocation because negotiating an audit clause in a click wrap agreement is almost impossible. But look at who can do it. Is it the licensor? Licensor's agents? How many agents? Hundreds of them? Are they, can they be competitors? Because this is any duly authorised representative, which the judge didn't really decide on. This looks pretty broad to me, but even that, no, 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 not anyone you want. You've got to be reasonable. Is it, should it be only an independent third party? Because if the software owner is auditing, they have a financial incentive to find breaches. Maybe an independent third party has a financial incentive to find breaches. But if they're an independent third party, surely they cannot have a financial incentive to find breaches. Because otherwise they aren't independent. And then who appoints them? Could you say, no, 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 we'll appoint someone to audit us and give you the report? You know, because that's fair. We'll appoint someone independent, but they're beholden to us. There's all of that. Then the restrictions. Annually, not before the second anniversary, once during the term, not for two or three years after the previous audit. You can put stuff in about disruption and reasonable notice. There's all sorts of soft things that are quite hard to argue against if you're having a proper negotiation that you can put in that make invoking one of these clauses very difficult. 
Conversely, if you're a licensor, think about these things going in and how they might restrict you. What can be audited? Again, going back to 118 and IDS, looks like everything can be audited, but no, probably not. So is it only a system and technical audit? The kind of thing you can just run a bot through a system to do now? Or is it an audit of all the books? Or do you have to keep a set of separate books? And, or do you just have carte blanche? You can audit everything. And who pays? This is an interesting one. Party, you know, my client paid $2 million of its own money. Right? Should, should, should the parties bear their own costs? Or should the licensor bear all the costs unless it finds a breach? Licensors won't sign up to that, but it's all worth, worth fun negotiation. And then what happens? Sometimes this is in the clause. Breach is discovered. There's a measure of damages written in the clause. That makes the negotiation a lot easier for the licensor, but frankly for the licensee too. But more often than not, it's pretty vague what happens. And then what if there's no breach? Or the relationship is harmed. So how do you avoid that if you're the licensor? So that's the sort of a checklist to think about when you, when you look at these clauses. As I say, you're probably only going to look at them when a client or your internal team is being audited. You're probably not going to be negotiating them in a standard click wrap license. So, license breach considerations. What to do? So the audit's happened. You've resisted it tooth and nail, but it's come in. The audit's been run. You are in breach. And you can have a legal negotiation about how in breach you are, but I think whatever happens, don't just take the license or, or the audit agent's word for it. Review the contract and the audit process. Make sure you agree, because as I say, license, particularly if an independent third party paid by a licensor is going to have a financial incentive to find one. The license audit team at a big software house is going to have a financial incentive to find a breach, so do your counter audit. I mean, if it's just a few grand, you can pay it, whatever, but if it's a material sum of money. And then consider why you're in breach. I think this informs your negotiation strategy. So as it is innocence, incompetence, or malfeasance. You know, you just misunderstood the meaning of these clauses. These clauses are very complicated. You made an innocent mistake. Or was it bad management? You didn't, you changed your system without double checking things. Yeah, you're in breach. It's a technical breach. Yes, you're in breach. You recognize you're in breach, but, but the IT team just changed something without realizing it. Or you were part of an M&A deal with it and didn't double check everything back. It's kind of, you know, an incompetent mistake. Not necessarily pure innocence, but an incompetent mistake. And then, well, you thought you'd get away with it. And if you, if you, you know, particularly if there's a paper trail saying, oh, don't worry, you, you're going to have a different negotiation than if, if it was just some sneaky change that came in on a PDF attached to a URL at some point during the term of the license. And then consider what you're in the hole for. Large bill or a risk of injunction? If it's a bill, negotiate away. If it's an injunction that put, put if you're at risk of an injunction that could threaten your business, your negotiation strategy will be very different. And then also, what are you in the hole for? If it's not that much money, and really they're just trying to get you to buy their cloud solution, then you've got a much better negotiation position to have. You could just basically buy something you were going to buy anyway, but perhaps from that vendor rather than another vendor. So that's a sort of why you're in breach, what you're at risk of, and then what are your chances, what's your appetite to litigate? Very rarely these things get litigated. Obviously, AFD and ZIT went to court. It was 12 million quid, English High Court litigations. Notoriously expensive. Brilliant value, but notoriously expensive. So consider your appetite to litigate. But if you're innocent, if you are genuinely innocent, and there's some kind of estoppel argument you could run, or even if you're just a bit incompetent, and there's some estoppel arguments you could allude to, you know, maybe it's worth playing hardball if there's a lot of money on the table. But that point, when you've configured all that out, then you negotiate. You know, if you know that there's loads of smoking gun emails saying, ah, ignore it, don't worry about it, we'll get away with it, you're probably paying as quick as you can and trying to negotiate a price. But if, if there's other things there, and the CIOs get very upset by this because they, their professionalism's at stake, they've made a mistake, and they, they want to negotiate and get a good price off these, these people, so you have to... I can find as lawyers increasingly we have to support them on that because there isn't the appetite just to pay them to go away. So that's, that's it. So what happens? So again, where are the negotiation pressure points? Quite often, big vendors will come in and say you have to pay us list price. 
Not the 2010 list price when you took out the license, the 2015 list price backward, which is perhaps a try on. Or what if you agreed a 50% discount in 2010? Your starting point, well, no, 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 we'll pay you, we're in breach, we'll pay you at a 2010 list price with the discount we agreed in 2010. That's your, already you've got a big difference. What, what's the contractual basis that the damages would be measured at? If the contract is silent, and it often is, the vendor will be saying the highest number it can think of, but you should be thinking, how do I lower that number legitimately? Yeah, I've made an innocent mistake, I've made an incompetent mistake. Okay, probably some dodgy emails out there, we probably just ignored it and hoped it would go away. Mistake. You know, these are the discussions. The point about software pricing is it's a mythical beast. It changes as you get nearer to quarter end. So the whole argument, even more so, is with these audits, is pure profit. The original sale had all the costs of sale associated with it, which were recovered during the license fees. This is just pure money going into their account. That plays into the negotiation on both sides, because both sides see it. So consider, consider also, what's the current list price? Software prices are going down. They always do. And what other commercial leverage do you have? New sales are worth more, arguably, than legacy income. You know, sales people are incentivized to get new sales. That's an interesting debate. I mentioned it already. Don't forget the impact of quarter end. And um, this is a whole other talk, which is a second-hand software debate. Because you could find yourself in breach and using more software than you should over here. But over here, you might have software you're no longer using from the same vendor. And second-hand software, the law is very vague, but there is those decisions out there you bring into the negotiation. Well, we've got all this software here that we might flog on the market. What do you think of that software vendor? Let's have a grown-up discussion. Why don't we retire those licenses and not pay for these licenses, and then we're all clean and we've got a nice settlement agreement? These the layers and layers and layers of discussion, this is just some of the stuff, some of the arguments we see deployed in these debates. Now, following AFD, we can all run estoppel arguments. Software marketing materials are notoriously puffy and nothing to do with what's written in the contract. Again, as a barrister advise my client, don't go to court on it, but it's, there's, some good, there's some good estoppel arguments that you can run just in the debate because they're not going to get a QC's opinion and you're not going to get a QC's opinion and go to court to argue estoppel. Just arguing it frames the discussion. If you could say, you said this in this email, yes, you said this in your FAQs, and yes, there are odds, and yes, your contract said this, and yes, it all says we have to go back to the contract, but you still said that over there in that email, and that's what caught us out, because I'm a CIO, I don't read the rest of it, I just read the email from your salesman, who I trust. Frames the debate and makes a difference to where you end up, potentially. So, as I say, if you're innocent or even incompetent, a hardball negotiation strategy can work. If you're not, look out. So, so where, where are we now? Where is the market now? I think it's very, very rare that full list price is paid when an audit, go, when an audit comes through. I think, I think it's, it's quite unusual. The, the vendors don't want to punish their customers. Quite often, the audit is a means to try and sell a new solution. Quite often, the solution is nothing to do with what's over there. It's, not, it's, it's just it's a rather weird way. It's a bit like little boys in playgrounds pulling pigtails of getting attention of your customer. But it, it, it's a bad metaphor. But, you know, it, 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 you know it's like it'd be horrible to someone to get them to buy something off you. It's like, but that, that is a reason. That is perceived to be why this is happening. Because quite often, the solution is buy our cloud solution, a new sale. And so I, th I think... You know, if you go into it thinking it's going to be litigation, it's going to be war, it's going to be... You know, that's not wise. If you go into it thinking what they're actually after, they're not actually trying to put us out of business. They're not actually trying to get us to pay them a load of money for useless stuff we don't use that we're only in breach of by mistake. There is a wider thing. So I think fi finding a way to make, make a, a fair and equitable deal is the way to do it. And I think if you do that, on the whole particularly if you escalate past the person who's incentivized to get you for the audit, so the wider relationship at the software vendor, you can, you can find a solution. 
and install software asset management tools. So that, that's it. Be ready if they happen. Take care when you sign contracts. It probably is time to start negotiating the audit clause. With the advent of cloud, stuff's changing because it's easier to measure what you're using. But, but it, it, the software audit provision is not the backwater it once was. It is very lively with a lot of our clients and a lot of our contemporaries and other firms and a lot of our clients in-house are saying it's coming up a lot. So thank you very much.